Please think about this. When an entire generation has been told repeatedly that there is no such thing as truth, then the only option left is to exercise power. What I'm trying to say is this. The destruction of communities is on purpose because the totalitarian mindset must remake society in its own image. All right, let's get to it. This video is going to be about explaining the theoretical foundation and social implications of this ideological movement called identity politics. I urge everyone to please watch the entirety of this video. I know it's a long video and that I am biased because we produced it, but there are a lot of very pertinent ideas and how they affect society and what we are witnessing today that are unpacked in this video. Now, as I said in the very first video, this belief system represents a radical worldview, a radical ideology. And I don't mean radical in the 1980s sense of the word. And to show how radical this ideology is, I need to first spend some time unpacking its core theoretical beliefs. So grab your philosophy books and an IV drip bag of coffee because you're going to need it. Let's go. Identity politics as a movement adopts a certain strand of postmodern theory that views knowledge as not some objective dimension out there in reality, independent of our own interpretations, but instead views knowledge as a cultural construct of our own making. Language, or what is referred to as discourse, is how we think about things and is how knowledge is produced in society. And what these discourses produce and reproduce is knowledge that is so embedded or baked into society that they become part of the cultural air we breathe, so as to become invisible to us and impossible for us to see, and therefore impossible to extricate ourselves from. So instead of knowledge being based upon some objective dimension found in reality, knowledge according to this form of postmodern theory is not only socially constructed, but inherently subjective and arbitrarily chosen. This explains why you might have heard the phrases so often repeated by those who hold to this ideology that gender is a social construct, or that knowledge is a cultural construct, or that our concepts of right and wrong are simply one version amongst many that we have just arbitrarily accepted, or that reality is for us simply a cultural artifact of a Western colonial patriarchal meta-narrative that we have adopted as a story to give meaning to our lives. What these statements are referring to is the postmodern belief that reality is socially and culturally constructed, so that what we think of as truth is simply the byproduct of our own social conventions, and that these meta narratives, these overarching stories, have no correspondence with reality, truth, and objectivity. Now, to be honest, there are differing degrees of how this belief is interpreted and applied within both the literature of identity politics and postmodern thought. And it's not just that these meta narratives, these discourses of knowledge exist and are socially constructed. It's also that these stories contain a hidden dimension of power within them. And it's this concept of power that sits at the core of this ideological position. And it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that this concept of power is fundamental to this belief system. These stories, these meta narratives, not only situate ourselves in this world and become invisible to us, but they also shape, determine, and legitimize what counts as knowledge, and just as importantly, what doesn't count as knowledge in society. In short, these cultural constructs of knowledge not only become powerful systems within themselves, but they also legitimize what the dominant mode of discourse is. And in this process, whatever mode of discourse becomes the dominant mode also means by default that the other modes of discourse are marginalized, that is, they are oppressed. According to postmodern theory, knowledge is passed from person to person through a process called socialization, which is not only how we transfer knowledge to one another, but also how we view that knowledge. And it's this very process that conditions us to see the world only through that perspective. This is the concept of cultural hegemony, which was introduced by the Marxist theorist Antonio Gramsci, in which the leaders and institutions in society 
not only socializes us into the dominant mode of discourse, but also establishes the social order of the status quo. In other words, the existence of these hegemonic power structures produce consent by default. We can't critique them because we can't see them, yet they continue to shape, mold, and influence us. The best example of this is the fish and water analogy. The fish lives in water, but doesn't know he lives in water. But if we took him out of that water, he would cease to exist. The water, if you will, determines his existence. Much in the same way that the society in which we live in as a cultural construct is also invisible to us, yet it continues to influence and determine us. And according to postmodernism, these big stories, these grand narratives, these cultural constructs can include everything from Marxism, capitalism, science, the belief in progress, reason, logic, and rationality, the correspondence theory of truth, mathematics, the theory of evolution, democracy, psychology, essentialism, Christianity, art, literature, even the belief that stories should all have a beginning, middle, and end are not only considered as cultural constructs, but are also considered as suspect under the auspices of postmodern theory. As one famous postmodernist remarked, postmodernism is defined as an incredulity towards meta narratives. What this means is that this theory calls into question any monolithic overarching belief systems and attempts to dismantle them by revealing and exposing the internal errors and contradictions within them, while simultaneously exposing the hidden power structures within them that have dominated discourse at the expense of the underprivileged and oppressed local narratives in society. Now, with all that being said, I need a drink of water. <laughs> I'll be right back. Okay, so let me take this from the abstract to the concrete by using the discipline of math as an example and deconstruct it according to postmodern theory. Math, it is assumed, according to a modern understanding, works so well because it is a symbolic representation of an objective reality, which can be tested and retested for confirmation against that reality. That interpretation of math tends to be a modernist interpretation. However, math, according to a postmodernist interpretation, is not a body of objective truth, but is just one version amongst multiple versions that our society has subjectively selected and elevated to preeminence. Now, please understand, postmodernists are not arguing that math is either true or false, but simply that it is arbitrary. According to postmodern theory, the fact that two plus two equals four is not some observable phenomenon of objective reality, but is simply another cultural construct that our society invented and in the process has vested both power into and away from other forms or discourses of knowledge, such as the possibility that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Now, please know that I am only explaining what postmodern theory means in regards to knowledge production. My critique will be in the next video, so if you find this view shocking, please don't stone the messenger. There is a way out of this morass. Now, tied into this postmodern understanding of knowledge is another important belief taken from postmodern theory which is that these invisible power structures also determine where one finds oneself situated within that framework of discourse. This is technically referred to as positionality within the literature of identity politics. And what this concept means is that the social position that you occupy in society determines whether or not you are part of the dominant or oppressed groups of people. In essence, your position in the framework of society determines what mode of discourse you can see. And these discourses, because of the power dynamic involved in them, develop into what is called hierarchies of power that either privilege some or oppress others. Now, why is this important? This is crucially important because it's through this concept of hierarchies of power that politics is introduced into the discussion. This power dynamic that this ideology claims to exist at all times opens up the door for theory to become politically activated. This belief system not only justifies political action on behalf of the oppressed and their discourses, but gives the marching orders for theory to jump from academia into the political realm. This is an important point to grasp, because according to postmodern theory, when you strip everything away, all that is beneath our social constructs is nothing but raw, naked power. Therefore, politics is all there is. Discourses, because they are infused with power, and create imbalances of power necessarily traps the oppressed within them, which means their very rescue depends upon political action to free them. 
thus the theoretical and moral justification for constant political action. This explains why more and more avenues of life are becoming politicized. And it's from this process that the terms social justice and social justice activism get their animating force. This belief in the ubiquity of politics and power also has a profound transformative effect upon everything this ideology touches, including learning itself, or what is referred to as pedagogy, or in this case, what is now referred to as critical pedagogy. This means that one's role as a teacher or professor who simply passively relays information from one generation to the next has now been transformed into the role of political activists. Their role is to now help the oppressed and to liberate them from the tyranny of the dominant mode of discourse by empowering them with critical tools to reject that discourse and see themselves through the lens of group identity. That is, they must be woken up. And your role as a student, if you accept this ideology, or if you are indoctrinated into this ideology, is to no longer passively absorb knowledge, but to actively challenge it and the powerful discourses in society. In other words, you must become woke. Now what's interesting is that this awakening or adoption of what is called a new critical consciousness is eerily similar to the same kind of conversion experience that religious people experience. What this entails is that political action on the part of those who hold to this ideology is not some mere anomaly, but is baked into the theory itself and represents a kind of cathartic and devotional aspect to this ideology. In a very real sense, it's this aspect of this ideology that gives people a sense of direction and purpose. It makes them feel as if they've been given special secretive insider knowledge into how society truly functions. And this explains the fervent zeal they have for these beliefs, once converted to them, that once again seem to mimic religious devotion. In short, identity politics calls forth political action and is exactly the reason why the word politics is found in the second half of the phrase identity politics. Now, I want to tweak this out some more because I don't think enough people truly understand the radical nature of this belief system and what it fully entails. The moral imperative that comes with this ideology doesn't give you the option to pick and choose what you think sounds good and reject the rest. This ideology doesn't give you the option to treat it as some sort of intellectual buffet. On the contrary, when confronted with it, you must either side with it completely or you are against it by default. There is no other choice. Please understand, this is not me forcing this decision upon you. It's within the theory itself. Now, on a personal note, I have throughout my life met a lot of very good people who are very socially aware and who don't like what they see in society and the injustice in society and who strive to be both compassionate and understanding. Or they've had family and friends who have experienced racism, discrimination, sexism, and bigotry. Or they themselves have experienced it so that they know full well its sting. So for them, these topics are felt on a deeply personal level. But here's the thing. If you believe that way and think that way, which I am glad you do, then you need to keep those precious beliefs quarantined far away from this ideology. Because if you think it's okay to incorporate some of its beliefs and ideas into your own belief system, then you really haven't understood this ideology yet. This ideology is not what you think it is. And I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence. It's just that most people underestimate this ideology's demands. It's a whole package deal. If you break this ideology up into pieces, then you no longer have the essence of this worldview and are actually violating the tenets of its own belief system. Just to clarify once again, I am not saying that you can't think or believe what you want or that you can't make your own choices or incorporate some of its beliefs or concepts into your own personal belief system. It's not a question of ability, but a question of ideological incommensurability. This worldview of identity politics doesn't give you the permission because the beliefs within it are tied to its own epistemological base. It's not about accepting certain beliefs. It's that those beliefs are tied into this entirely new way of viewing the world and can only make sense from that perspective. This is the postmodern dimension of this ideology. This right here is the most radical part of this ideology, the most underestimated and the least understood. This may be the most confusing part of this ideology, but hopefully as I unfold this topic, you'll begin to see exactly what I mean when I say that this system of thought is totalitarian 
because the identity of the group and the direction of the group and the belief system of the group is more important than your individual beliefs. Your individual beliefs are a null point within this framework. To use the language of identity politics, if you are only agreeing with certain parts or aspects of this ideology, then you are not a friend or ally to this belief system, but rather an enemy of it. And according to this system, you are actually part of the problem. What this means is that you wrongly believe in the marketplace of ideas approach to knowledge, which is anathema, a curse to identity politics. They view that as a concept that is itself oppressive. Let me put it like this. If you believe that human beings should have the ability to freely and openly dialogue and debate with one another, and that the individual in society should have the ability to incorporate into his or her own belief system whatever ideas he or she so chooses, then congratulations, you are now an enemy of this ideology. What this means is that you are operating under the older classical liberal view of society in which a plurality of ideas are able to peacefully coexist with one another. It's that very idea that identity politics rejects and attacks. Neutrality as a concept, according to this ideology, is how oppressive ideas cause harm. Now, I personally believe that the very reason why this ideology has caught on so quickly, especially amongst the youth, is because it mimics what looks like the same underlying ethos of the older conception of a free and open society. And most young people are simply unaware of that reality. Not to belittle the youth, which is not what I'm trying to do, but due to their inexperience, their worldviews are typically not fully formed, which I believe this ideology exploits to its own advantage. It hides itself in ambiguity for a reason. That's why it doesn't define itself or give proof. It even uses language that is similar to mask over those differences. This is the virus-like replication effect that I spoke about in the very first video. However, every once in a while, its true totalitarian nature rises to the surface. This explains the phrases or slogans you may have heard of or seen that says, silence is violence, or the more disturbing one that says, liberals get the bullet too, which means that by your silence and your refusal to take action and stubborn antiquated belief in a neutral arena called the public square, where ideas compete with one another, is actually a form of oppression because that is the dominance group's chosen mode of discourse according to this ideology. Therefore, if you believe or engage in this type of discourse, you are guilty by default. This also explains why this ideology has placed a ban upon certain words. Because if language is all there is, and if reality is merely a reflection of that language or social construct, then this means that language doesn't just describe reality, but creates reality. Thus the birth and justification of what is known as political correctness, which explains why this ideology must repress freedom of speech and cancel people because of that mode of discourse, according to their perspective, is causing oppressive harm. That's why advocates of this ideology do not debate or engage in dialogue. You don't see any woke apologist for this movement for a reason. This explains why they must shout down and yell at people because debating and dialogue, according to this paradigm, is not only seen as using the master's toolkit of oppression, but also legitimizes the dominant group's favorite mode of discourse, which itself is oppressive. That's why they don't engage in civil conversation. To debate and dialogue is to allow the oppressor groups in society to frame and rig the debate so that stepping into the ring of the marketplace of ideas is not only a zero-sum game, a no-win scenario, but is actually, according to this belief system, legitimizing the dominant group's cultural hegemony. And to be honest, those that are civil and engage in polite conversation are actually not being consistent with this ideology's belief system, which once again explains why members of this group go after each other, call each other out, and cancel each other constantly. This is part of the race to the bottom that I mentioned in the first video. There is massive infighting within this group over this very point. And to deal with this moral inconsistency or lukewarm devotion, this group has created a purity principle or a purity test to weed out true believers from non-believers. In a very real sense, this purity test is similar to a doctrinal test that many religions use for that same purpose. And it's this belief that underscores and fosters the mindset that says that you don't debate or dialogue with evil. 
but instead must shout it down and repress it at all costs. This, of course, is the political theorist and Marxist Herbert Marcuse's concept of repressive tolerance, which justifies intolerance to be practiced against ideas that don't agree with the underlying worldview of identity politics or cultural Marxism. And it's this same idea, this very postmodern idea, that many people aren't even aware of that lies at the heart of our current political climate of cancel culture, censorship, and fact-checking, in which any information that doesn't fit the current narrative, meta-narrative, or mainstream narrative must suffer from the death of a thousand qualifications. There is way more going on here than most people are even aware of. In a nutshell, theory precedes practice. This is what is referred to as praxis, or theory put into practice, so that what has and is taking place in academia is now hitting the streets and soaking into society. And this idea of repressive tolerance also explains why people who adopt this worldview don't see political violence as violence. Rioting, destruction of property, burning down buildings, and attacking people are seen through the lens of this ideology as the very institutions, vehicles, and discourses of power, the cultural hegemony of the oppressor groups in society. Therefore, this justifies and exonerates and glorifies that type of behavior. This also explains why they are so focused upon language, because for them, language itself is the truest act of violence, thus the birth of what is known as hate speech, trigger warnings, microaggressions, and safe spaces. This is why this ideology is dangerous, because it slowly transforms what is evil into good, in which the end justifies the means. And if there is anything you take from this video, please take this. The danger of all ideologies is that they do the thinking for you. I'm going to repeat that. The danger of all ideologies is that they do the thinking for you. What I'm trying to show is that all of these beliefs and how they work themselves out in real world application flow from this ideology's theoretical base to form this radical, uncivil, intolerable monstrosity of a worldview. This worldview is not just antithetical to American society, but any and all societies. This is because the twin vices of incivility and insatiability are woven into the fabric of this ideology. Now, I want to take a moment here and belabor this point because it's important that we understand the true cause and effect relationship. It's not because they reject freedom that causes them to be uncivil. It's that freedom to them is uncivil. Freedom itself is a concept that the dominant group uses as a powerful tool of discourse to marginalize the oppressed. Freedom of ideas and freedom of speech is the conduit through which oppression occurs, which means that freedom of expression is not a universal belief according to their system of thought, but instead is a discourse of power that must be challenged and attacked. And the reason why they are both uncivil and insatiable is because this is what happens when your entire ideology is based entirely upon the subjectivity of human beings. When no objective criteria exist outside of the group or society, then there is no agreed upon standard or limit from which to judge and say, okay, now we are all equal and equitable. Now we can all chill and enjoy society together. That will never happen. That's one of the most dangerous aspects of this ideology. Its appetite is ferocious and will continually gnaw at the fabric of society, any society. It doesn't matter if that society is colonial, patriarchal, local, or indigenous. In a very real sense, this is a monster or virus that these academics and scholars, or to use the more technical word, imposters and charlatans to actual academics, have created and unleashed upon the world. That once accepted will not stop because it takes on a life of its own that no one can control or foresee. So contrary to what the purveyors of this ideology are saying, which is that this theory is simply an analytical tool or heuristic device, is simply not true because those analytic tools only make sense within this system of thought. There's either deception going on here, or these theorists don't understand basic epistemology. It's not that these beliefs are incongruent without this theory, it's that they are incommensurable without it. They don't make sense without the underlying ideology attached to it, which explains the divisive nature of this belief system. This is what I spoke about briefly in the first video, and is the reason why families, friendships, businesses, and every social institution this ideology infects is being torn to pieces right now. This ideology, if it's absorbed uncritically, 
turns children against their own parents, siblings against each other, and society on edge. Take any aspect of life right now, and you'll quickly see what I mean. Whether it's movies, politics, academia, comedy, churches, the Boy Scouts, surfing, sports teams, razor blade companies, commercials, comic books, hiking clubs, chess clubs, who should be vaccinated first, and even something as mundane and seemingly innocent as local sewing clubs are all being torn apart right now. And that is the most tragic aspect of this ideology, that it actually destroys communities and those precious groups that form the basis of any society. Sadly, many people view these things as mere anomalies, but they're not. They are part of the bread and butter of this ideological movement. They are not mere one-offs, but tactical. Some of you may have witnessed the recent ending of a prayer upon the house floor in DC, in which a representative closed his prayer by saying, Amen and a women. That was not a fluke nor a mistake, nor was it a fringe element of this belief system. This belief system seeks to deconstruct, subvert, and problematize language. It's not to open up space for some alternative discourse, it's to take over that space. This is technically referred to within the literature of postmodern theory as parology, or within identity politics as problematize. It's the creation of alternative meaning to disrupt, subvert, and replace traditional forms of knowledge, and create this pseudo-reality that will eventually consume it. That's the totalitarian nature of this belief system. Remember that power structures in society, social constructs, can be toppled according to this ideology by changing how we talk about things, by changing the language. And so many people are under the illusion that that's not happening and that people like me are just being alarmist or focusing on only the kookier aspects of this ideological movement. And to be honest, I wish that was true. Now. I want to diverge here for a second and bring in some wisdom from a French political philosopher named Alexis de Tocqueville and his insightful analysis of American and French society and the work of sociologist Robert Nisbet and his profound understanding of the need for human communities. So synthesizing Tocqueville and Nisbet's analysis is this, voluntary social institutions are the very glue that holds society together. And not only are they outlets for human expression, but also act as bulwarks against the dangers of a leviathan-like and omnipotent government. And whenever these voluntary social institutions are weakened and its buffering effect mitigated against the state, then tyranny and despotism lies right around the corner. And this process of the weakening of social institutions took place in real time for all the world to see, leading up to what is known as the French Revolution, because it was these vibrant, healthy, and robust social institutions that French society did not have because they had withered away under the feudalism of the Anse regime so that when greater forces appeared, there was nothing to protect society, which led them straight into the chaos of the French Revolution, the horrific civil war in the Vendée, the bloodshed of the terror, the megalomania of Robespierre, and powerless against the tyranny of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now this same process of weakening and destroying social institutions, especially the family, which is the root and bedrock of all institutions in society, took place and was undermined in China during what is known as the Cultural Revolution under Mao Zedong's leadership and led directly to the creation of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party of today. Once again, ideas have consequences and bad ideas and bad ideologies have disastrous social consequences. Wrong theories, they make the person holding to them feel better about themselves, while also burning the world to the ground. This is serious stuff. I know I'm probably coming across way too strong and appearing as alarmist and hypercritical, but I feel like I have to ring the bells and warn people to please don't flirt with ideas that could burn everything you hold dear to the ground. Ideas are the most powerful thing in this world. Now, what this ideology means for society, any society, is that the list of social grievances will never stop because they are not only indefinite but ad infinitum. They will go on forever because subjective human beings can always find something more to be desired of or offended about. And since discourses never stop, then seeking social justice will never stop, which means politics will never stop. This is not only another example of a theory put into practice, but is also why in the final analysis, 
is that this ideology is an anti-social ideology. It will never be satisfied, which is exactly what we are witnessing today. And unless you are somehow still under the illusion that what I am describing does not represent the core of this ideology, but just a few bad apples are the fringe elements of this ideology, then all I can say to you is ad fontes, go to the sources. Now all the things that I've been describing hopefully will highlight this point, which as I said earlier, is that you either have to accept this ideology in toto, in its entirety, or not at all. There is no other choice. Once again, this is not me telling you that you have to do this, but this is the moral and theoretical demands that this ideology places upon you. This is the totalizing nature of this ideology. It is totalitarian. You are not afforded a neutral position from which to judge and weigh the evidence. Now, I really want to hammer this point home to anybody that is still undecided or sitting on the fence when it comes to this belief system. So let me try to make this as crystal clear as possible. Saying you believe in only certain ideas of this ideology and want to incorporate them into your own personal belief system is like saying you believe in the soul or the mind, yet still hold to the philosophy of materialism, which is what we talked about in last week's video. The philosophical position of materialism eliminates that belief, just as identity politics eliminates that choice. Now, I also want to challenge people's conception of totalitarianism, because I think a lot of people have a wrong view of it, which if they do, this means that their radar is inoperable and is unable to spot incoming threats. Many people view totalitarianism as the complete and total state control over society. However, that conception is really just the mechanism or outward form, or to be precise, the final form that totalitarianism takes, but it's not the essence of it. Before it can manifest as complete state control, it must first exist as an idea, a mindset, an attitude, or a belief system from which it springs. In other words, a totalitarian mind must exist prior. And the essence of totalitarianism is the complete politicization of life. The more areas of life that become politicized, the less areas of human freedom exist. This is the essence of totalitarianism. And as freedom decreases, ideological authoritarianism increases. And what we are witnessing today is the sprouting of that seed. Here's the thing. Totalitarianism doesn't just happen overnight. You don't just go to bed and wake up the next morning and find yourself living under a totalitarian regime. It happens slowly, incrementally, and subtly. What needs to occur first is that the social institutions in society at every level must be subverted and taken over. This is what is referred to as the long march to the institutions, which is a direct take on Gramsci's idea of cultural hegemony. Please think about this. When an entire generation has been told repeatedly that there is no such thing as truth, then the only option left is to exercise power. What I'm trying to say is this. The destruction of communities is on purpose because the totalitarian mindset must remake society in its own image. I have one request for anyone who watches this video. If you are thinking that the battle lied between Donald Trump or Joe Biden, then you aren't thinking big enough. And I don't mean that as an insult to anyone's intelligence. My purpose by doing these videos and starting this channel is not to belittle anyone or create enemies, but to get to the truth. And I urge you to readjust and reconfigure your own worldview, broaden it, so that you can see the real battle taking place right now in real time. If you can grasp postmodern theory, which everyone can, then you'll be able to understand the operating system of its proponents, advocates, and true believers. And once you do, not only will everything start to make sense, culturally speaking, but you'll never be able to unsee it. This is why I say that I don't think that many people truly understand what it is they are believing, saying, and repeating. I believe many people are simply swept up in the romanticism of this movement and neither understand the postmodern substructure nor the disastrous social consequences of what they are doing. And this is why I urge everyone to get past the enchanting slogans and peer beneath the soft underbelly of this ideology, because there exist a lot of dangerous, dangerous ideas 
that people are not aware of, which again is why I created this video to expose that theoretical sublayer, and not to talk down to anyone or belittle anyone, but to help my other fellow human beings who are struggling to understand these complex social issues. Look, I have studied postmodern thought for over 15 years now, and I am familiar with most of the major works and major authors. And I have read most of the scholarly articles from the major players in critical theory, critical race theory, the Frankfurt School, critical legal studies, gender studies, critical pedagogy, the liberation movement, feminism, first, second, third wave feminism, and some aspects of black feminist ideology from which the concept of intersectionality is born, which we will be discussing here in a moment. The reason I am saying these things is not because I'm trying to show off. I could care less about winning a popularity contest. That's not why I started this channel. What I care about is the truth and defending the truth. Also, I bring this up to hopefully show you that I am not just some random guy on your screen who started a channel on YouTube and is clueless about what he's talking about. And hopefully as time goes on, I will be able to gain your trust even more so that the topics I speak about is because I have some knowledge and depth of understanding about them. Now, what's interesting to note before we move on is that these concepts that identity politics incorporates into its theoretical base are not only iterations of postmodern theory and have their origin in postmodern theory, but they depend upon postmodern theory for their coherence and acceptance. Now, why is this important? It's simple. If you can show that the postmodern theory upon which identity politics rest is itself a weak reductionistic theory that refutes itself, which we talked about in the second video, then the whole house of cards upon which identity politics is built falls with it. In other words, if the undergirding theory of postmodernism is bunk, so too is this ideology. Now, getting back to identity politics is that tied into this belief of one's position in society, which is either differing degrees of dominance or oppression, is also the belief that this position confers not only identity, but also how one's conception of knowledge is developed. This view of knowledge as being shaped by one's position in society is referred to as standpoint epistemology or standpoint theory. And what standpoint epistemology refers to, which I hinted at earlier, is that one's social position in society determines what they can and cannot see, and therefore what they can and cannot know. That's the epistemological dimension or dilemma. This is what is referred to as situated knowledge. Not only does the identity of the group each possess their own type of situated knowledge, their own culturally constructed discourse that they share in common as members of those groups, but this knowledge also confers upon them special access into a deeper understanding of reality. Remember earlier that one of the key beliefs of postmodern theory is that knowledge is subjective and therefore a social construct which when grafted onto this ideology means not only that one's knowledge is relative to one's social circumstances, but that certain groups have more access to knowledge than others. What this means and how this plays out in identity politics is that the marginalized and oppressed in society have the ability or extra ability to not only see the dominant mode of discourse in society, but also their own oppression under that discourse. This dual vision, if you will, as seen as an epistemic virtue, which confers upon the oppressed an authoritative and authentic knowledge that cannot be questioned or denied, because due to their marginalized position, it is only they that possess this insider information. It is only they who have a voice to speak. Everyone else needs to shut up, sit down, and listen according to this standpoint. This belief, of course, is captured infamously in the phrase to check your privilege or stay in your lane. This is why in the literature of identity politics, if you are a member of the dominant group, you cannot add to or criticize the conversation because you have no way of knowing the plight of the oppressed. It's not that you lack empathy. It's that you don't know what you don't know. You are epistemologically limited and hindered or epistemologically blind to this reality. This is why the phrase lived experiences has emerged upon the scene. This phrase refers to the first-hand accounts of the underprivileged in society who are living under an oppressive system. This is why this ideology puts so much emphasis upon narrative and storytelling and other forms of alternative discourse. 
And just to reiterate, these narratives, these lived experiences cannot be discounted or critiqued from someone whose group identity is part of the dominant group in society. Because once again, you don't know what you don't know. And to bring in another term from identity politics, if you are part of the dominant group, you are, because of your positionality in society, privileged. And part of that privilege is that you don't even know it. That's where this word privilege originates within this matrix of thought. Therefore, once again, according to this theory, the only option for the privileged is to be silent and let the underprivileged perspective speak. This is important because many people wrongly assume that the concept of privilege refers only to the social economic advantages that one enjoys. However, privilege, to be theoretically precise, refers to one's positionality in society. And it's from that position of privilege that all the benefits supposedly accrue. And I'll say this again. If you can show that this ideology is theoretically false and reductionistic and unfalsifiable, then this concept attached to it falls with it. Now, in addition to standpoint theory, which identity politics absorbs into its theoretical foundation, is also the theories drawn most prominently from what is called critical race theory. In reality, critical race theory is identity politics. And critical race theory, as the name suggests, has its origin in critical theory, which distinguishes it from the more traditional theories. And that distinguishing mark is that critical theory is critical of the underlying structures and institutions within society and seeks to challenge and transform them predominantly through the lens of a Marxist analysis. This is where, once again, the concept of cultural hegemony comes into play. And the group that popularized this critical approach were known as the Frankfurt School. And it's this same critical mindset that informs critical race theory, except it seeks to apply these critical methods not so much to economic class analysis, but to issues of race in society. And it challenges what it views as the older traditional theories about race by synthesizing into its own foundation these methods and concepts borrowed not only from critical theory, but also from critical legal studies and postmodern theory as a means of social critique. And one of the key concepts that critical race theory adds is the concept of intersectionality, which you may have heard of which refers to how a person's identity can be analyzed through a framework of multiple intersecting categories, and that one's identity can face multiple levels of discrimination or privilege depending upon their positionality within the dominant mode of discourse. According to Kimberly Crenshaw, who originated this idea, she used the example of a street intersection to highlight how someone standing at the intersection could get hit from multiple directions, and that when it comes to someone's identities, they could be hit or discriminated against from multiple directions without ever knowing from which direction, depending upon how many identities that person has, and therefore the more marginalized your group identities are, the greater your chances of getting hit. It's precisely through this multi-layered analysis of intersectionality or matrix that gives rise to an ever-increasing scope of categories or identities through which one can be oppressed. So for example, if you are a black, transgender, handicapped person, you have a much greater chance of getting hit with prejudice and discrimination due to the various overlapping intersections of your identities than would a white, cisgender, able-bodied male, because those identities are part of the dominant discourse, while the other ones are marginalized in society, all according to this theory. And it's through Professor Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality that gave birth to what is known as identity politics because it is the identity of the group and not the individual which counts. The individual no longer exists under this theory. It's not that the older traditional theories of the individual have been refuted. It's that the individual as a concept no longer exists under this new theory. And as I said in the second video, it's simply been brushed aside. This once again is baked into the theory itself. Now some of you may be saying, how is that possible? How can you get rid of the individual? Well, remember, that according to this ideology, knowledge is a social construct, truth is a social construct, race is a social construct, and therefore the individual is a social construct. What this means is that identity politics views the individual as a socially constructed concept that has been invented by the dominant groups and used as a conceptual hammer of oppression under the mask of objectivity to marginalize the oppressed. 
This is what intersectionality seeks to replace. In other words, group identity is a direct assault on the concept of individuality. This once again demonstrates the all or nothing totalitarian nature of this ideology at both the epistemic and ethical level. This is why this ideology focuses upon such things as knowledge being a social construct, the hierarchies of power within that construct, the dominant modes of discourse that flow from that construct, one's positionality or standpoint within that framework, and the intersecting identities of these socially constructed groups when it comes up against the dominant discourses in society. Nowhere in that schema is the individual mentioned, because that is the dominant discourse, which identity politics completely rejects because of the oppressive nature of that concept. Now, this is usually when most people are shocked to see not only the profound social implications of this ideological movement, but also come to terms with the fact that they are not as socially progressive and enlightened as they thought they were when confronted with the theoretical and moral demands of this system of belief. In essence, a lot of people underestimate this ideology's commitment. If you are not in it to win it all the way, then you are a traitor to this movement. Because once again, you have not only been exposed to it, but the very fact that you choose to pick and choose what you want to believe in is itself a testament or marker that you're not operating under their same system of thought, but operating under a different worldview. Now, before this second video comes to a close, there is one more important concept that I need to address that critical race theory adds to the mix. And that is the concept called interest convergence, which is a theory introduced by Derek Bell that says that any racial progress that occurs within society only comes about for minorities when it serves the best interests of the dominant majority, specifically the white interest in society. Professor Bell applied this theory specifically to legal cases and argued that any case that was favorable to the underprivileged was not due to some judicious, enlightened moral breakthrough, but simply done when it served the best interests of the white population. In other words, equality under the law was only dished out to black people when it benefited white people. And this concept of interest convergence is integral to critical race theory, or what is known as identity politics. And fundamental to this concept is the view that society is inherently racist at all times and at all levels. This is the sine qua non of critical race theory. This belief in the ubiquity of racism that pervades and permeates society at all times is essential to this theory. Now, hopefully I've given you food for thought here, or at least that was my intent. Now that we've unfolded some of the core theoretical beliefs of this belief system, we can now together provide a critical evaluation of it next week. So with that being said, non ducor duco, I am not led, I lead.